have one customer that we took 17 parts in their drone and consolidated it into one single part, but it's because that industry has very low thresholds to make changes um, and has a lot of a uh, lot of latitude. The Industrial Sage Executive Series, sharing the stories behind game-changing executives, their organizations, and insights into today's industry challenges. Well, hello and welcome to today's Industrial Sage Executive Series. Today, I am interviewing Ethan Eskowitz, who is the CEO and founder of Eris Composites, located all the way out in California. Ethan, thank you so much for joining me today on the Executive Series. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Danny. Well, I'm looking forward to this and you know, kind of you know, jumping into this episode. So for those who aren't familiar uh, with Eris Composites, we'll kind of start with there. You know, uh, what do you guys do? So we make products uh, okay, yes. <laughs> broadly. <laughs> so obviously uh, composites are an important part of those products and the continuous fiber composites that we're able to produce have the highest strength to weight ratios, uh, which is why they've been used so broadly in aerospace. Uh, but we've really enabled mass production of these methods that really started in these very high performance applications for use everywhere in all kinds of different applications. And in addition to that, we can make um, a complex products that not only have uh, continuous fiber composites, but also other materials like metals or plastics or um, whatever is required for the particular functional requirements of a product. Okay, and and just to kind of uh, set the, the 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 scene here a little bit, how long have you guys been in business? So we started in 2017, so we're going into our fourth year. Okay, excellent. So. We're going to jump into a little bit more about Eris, what you guys do, some of the problems, you know, uh, challenges that you guys solve. But before we kind of do that, I want to do a little bit of a deep dive into Ethan. And I want to get to know you a little bit more and for our audience to get to know you a little bit more. How, uh, you know, sort of tell me, how did you get in the industry? So I had been in the traditional manufacturing technologies that uh, produce most of the products that surround us every day, the, the molding and casting and machining and stamping and things. Um, and in around 2009, I started working with uh, my first company that was involved in 3D printing. And that's when I became enamored with the technology. And really, since then, I've worked with um, plastic 3D printing companies, metal, composite, um, you know, both uh, private as well as working with commercializing um, 3D printing or additive molding technologies that uh, developed at um, Lawrence Livermore National Lab and, um, and, and finding uh, commercial applications for those. So really kind of the, the broad um, additive manufacturing spaces where I've spent the last 10 years. Uh, and that's really uh, those two aspects of my, my background in manufacturing, the conventional technologies, and then this new advanced manufacturing really specifically additive manufacturing and 3D printing is where I've spent the last decade. So how did you get into that before that? Was that something that you, were you sort of predisposed to the industry, uh, you, know, bef you know, in school or before that? And did you go to school? Like how, yeah. like, tell me that story. So I, I first, uh, you know, I, I had a geology degree. So, you know, the mechanical, uh, the mechanical and materials world that I am in was not really specifically what my training was. I actually shifted from mechanical when I was in school to, uh, to geology. Um, and I, I ended up working at Rico, a, a, you know, printer manufacturer. And, uh, and really th through that um, was, was really first exposed to um, to biz dev and technical products. And then I got a lot more interested in the product design and manufacturing world. And that's where I started getting exposed to a lot of the, uh, a lot of the different manufacturing technologies and the ways that you might make any product. Um, and it was really through seeing the important interaction between product design and uh, manufacturing technologies. So I got really interested in how you can have a differentiated commercial product as a result of leveraging new manufacturing technologies. And, and really 3D printing was the space uh, that 
in the late 2000s that a lot of people were looking to to unlock new potential, you know, medical, aerospace, consumer products, you know, there was grand aspirations for uh, where the 3D printing world might take many of these different industries. So it was the most exciting space to be in. It's, it's what I focused on. And some of those things have panned out, some of them haven't panned out. Um, yeah, the, 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 the story of the last 10 years in, in 3D printing is, is a very interesting one. Uh, but that's really how I found myself um, in this really, the space between research and development and the uh, really those killer applications for these new manufacturing technologies uh, that, that come, comes out of these research and development efforts. Excellent. So, you know, throughout your career journey, is there somebody or something that stands out in terms of, you know, something that's been a big inspiration or has helped to maybe shape a decision or just influence your, your career? Uh, you know, does anything jump out to you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, there's, there's a, a million credits. I'd, <laughs> I'd say I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm definitely a example of a, a lifelong learner and I'm a, a big advocate of mentors and you know I'm my audible is just filled up with you know uh, books I've, I've listened to um, and will listen to uh, you know repeatedly but one one specifically that um, has has always stuck with me and is, is very important with my career journey is um, is, is a lot of Malcolm Gladwell's work, but specifically the tipping point was one that um, really intrigued me when you hear about the stories of uh, these major industries that, that get to a point where there's a significant shift that happens of, of some sort. You know, one of the examples they give is uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, electronics, the computer industry, and how there was that major shift and where you have Larry Ellison and Bill Gates and you know Steve Jobs and and uh, and and these these individuals that happen to be you know very intelligent uh, individuals that are at the right place in history at the right time mm -hmm. um, and are imp important um, in shifting in in uh, in guiding these uh, these enterprises that come out of that. So I, I really took that narrative. I, I guess I read that, um, you know, probably around, you know, when it came out, or you know, probably around 2000 somewhere. So this was this was always a narrative that I was I brought into the search for uh, manufacturing technologies that enabled and unlocked commercial advantages in in the product design world. So I, I would definitely point back to that as a very like formative story, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, for. Um, for informing what I was what I was looking for in terms of uh, a, a technology and approach that could really make a difference that could really make make a major impact. Yeah, no, excellent. I, you know, it, that's a that's a great story and great. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of Malcolm Gladwell's work as as well. Um, and I would argue now we're at another tipping point. <laughs> you know, obviously this year has been a very interesting year to say the least. Um, and I think, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, there's a big focus on the negative on, you know, what's happening, what's going on. But I'd also say I would look at the opportunities that has been presented. And I think that we are really at a massive tipping point right now, um, especially when you look at disruptive technology in the manufacturing. I mean, you can look at it across the board. I mean, disruption is just handling just or is just uh, is happening across all industries. But I think specifically, you know, when you look at manufacturing, you look at supply chain, you look at, you know, all, all these different areas that we are at a huge tipping point. Um, what are some of those challenges that you are seeing uh, in your space right now? So, so yeah, there, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> first, the, 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 most, the, the most important thing with, um, you know, supply chains and, you know, the, manufacturing methods that um, are responsible for the majority of pr products that surround us in the world, you, you just can't change that much that fast. Right. So while, while I am absolutely a big advocate of a lot of the things that you're saying of things are shifting, um, 
for um, you know for the purchasing decision for a product that's made you know 100 of 100 units a month it's very easy to shift it from one place to another mm-hmm. uh, for um, you know the incredibly uh, complex products that you know that surround us in the world whether it's our automobiles where the bill of materials and the part count has gone up by tens of thousands mm-hmm. <laughs> over the the last couple decades and those become more complex or if it's our mobile devices where those are becoming even more complex um, there is such a complex supply chain that flows into any one of those it's actually really challenging to make major um, product architecture shifts in those industries. So that said, um, that that is why uh, you know for for decades, you know the fundamental way in which take a car uh, that's made with stamped metal and tack welded together on an assembly line, you know the basic architecture doesn't change a whole lot. But there are those kind of punctuated periods where you suddenly have a major shift. And that's where things get really interesting today, where you have, uh, if we're sticking with the automotive um, uh, industry, um, very disruptive things happening, Um, you know, electric, um, autonomous, uh, new business models, incredibly um, important shifts in the businesses like fleets. Um, And you, you can look at, analogs for some very interesting um, indicators of what we might expect from an industry like that. So um, commercial aerospace was uh, in 1970, uh, there was almost all metal in the planes. And between 1970 and today, it's gone all the way up to almost 80% composites in the Boeing Dreamliner. Because for every pound you remove out of the plane, it costs less for that plane's operator to fly that plane. So total cost of ownership drives the buying decision of planes. Vehicles, completely different. Vehicles did not go through that evolution at all because you know, for the longest time, it's just been, what's the sticker price? How good do I look in it? Let's kick the tires and I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy it. But with this major shift in, um, in ownership with fleets owning more, with total cost of ownership being more important, with um, you know, autonomous needing you know, these expensive assets to run as long as possible, uh, then we're actually shifting this major industry that consumes so many vehicles each year towards a business model that has a clear precedent to, uh, to really considering total cost of ownership and not just how good does it look when the buyer walks into a showroom. So it's, it's, it's um, the shifts like that, um, that, that driver from the, the commercial end where, where the end consumers um, uh, buying patterns are changing that actually provide us with with some of the incredible leverage that these industries are seeing uh, to change and do things differently. And you, we, can, we can obviously see that with the, the valuation of Tesla and the way in which they're doing a whole variety of things different from their predecessors. Uh, so I think your point is, is, is very, very powerful and very timely because in, in some areas we are completely limited by the legacy that's come before us. And in others, there's just these incredible uh, shifts that have happened in a very short period of time and and promise uh, continued disruption ahead. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's um, well, like you mentioned, you know, obviously making these changes, you know, you, you talked about earlier on the supply chain where you've got you know, just a you know, massive, massive list of components that you, and you're sourcing them from all over the place that not just, you know, changing suppliers is a very easy thing. Uh, but you mentioned you know, changing the infrastructure, the actual design applications of it makes it very difficult. I think it's interesting, uh, you know, talking about automotive, for example, you, you mentioned aerospace there too for a little bit. Um, that um, uh, the, the, really that nexus of technology coming in, you're talking about autonomous, and you know, you're having a lot of these uh, the cars. It's you know, from a from maybe a buying criteria. And I'll take my personally, for example, you know. Um, I used to not be very excited about all the technology. I mean, it was cool stuff right now, but now that's a, that's a kind of a big driver for me. It's like, yeah, yeah, car, the performance is great and all that good stuff, but I'm really, I'm really interested in what all the different, you know, how is this thing connected? And I, I want it to interface with my iPhone and all these different things to a point where that's actually gonna be a 
motivating purchase decision. Um, and it was, at least for me, uh, specific, of, you know, the whole car play thing. I loved it. Um, yeah. And, and I, there wasn't anything I was, that was like a, a got to have on my list, you know? So looking at things like that relative to how you're actually going to go and design and manufacture that and say, okay, well, now we've got to bring in all this additional infrastructure and design into it. Um, and you're seeing that not just in automotive, but, you know, across, across the board where maybe we didn't see this before. We've got a client that we work with in the, um, the lighting space, you know, okay, well, we have connected lights now <laughs> and, and, and look at, you know, the, the different kinds of data and the applications we can have there. So it's kind of having to rethink, not just the product design, but also the applications and the use cases, um, which affect, you mentioned, um, you know, the business case and how to go to market and how to even, you know, educate uh, market segments, whether it's, you know, internal stakeholders from a, from a sales standpoint to the consumers. And it gets very uh, interesting and, and, and complex. I think it's exciting. Uh, but um, yeah, you get into user experience there. And I think that user experience, and I'm actually in our factory adjacent to the train track. So uh, I, supply chain. Well, it's good. It's good. well yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, that's the supply chain in the background. Um, but but user experience is is incredibly important. And and typically, you know, when you think about uh, the, the, the car that you're talking about, as you put all of that functionality into the car, you imagine you're getting more and more and more components. Mm -hmm. In general, as, you know, the user experience has gone up, the part count's gone up and, and gotten even more complex. You know, we, we actually work in some interesting areas there where uh, you take an example of like a kind of next generation mobile phone that I can show you um, where, you know, you, you know, we're, we're able to take uh, and, and, and take the device, but make the, you know, the class A consumer surface finish. It's got to look very nice. But the important thing that really relates to what you were, what you were getting at is if I look at the actual enclosure that we're able to produce for these enclosure, uh, for, for these applications is putting this material that's stronger than titanium into these incredibly small features enables us to make it thinner and lighter and more desirable for the user to, to help with those kind of user experience things. But we're also able to um, integrate, and you might not be able to see it very well, but you can kind of see the, the wire leads mm -hmm. that run into the electronics that are actually in the enclosure itself, where these it, before are just machine pieces of metal or molded pieces of plastic. So you're actually getting smart structures that are removing components from the inside of the enclosure, putting it inside the device itself. So it's actually getting smarter. They perform better there. They're more rugged and your part count is going down. So this is a very simple um, uh, uh, version of that. But when you start imagining some of the kind of larger structures that mm. you might put into uh, a vehicle where this is, you know, the highest strength to weight ratio, continuous fiber composites running through that, where within that structure, you can start adding some of those sensors and electronics, and you can actually see a cross section of the yeah. truss with the wires that run through it. How you can actually not increase the part count, uh, you can you can uh, decrease the part count and get the better functionality and the better user experience. And a great example of where we're able to do this really fast is the drone industry. Uh, mm. it, the drone industry doesn't have these giant assembly lines and the long product development uh, cycles um, and and uh, you know thirty thousand parts that need to. To, to be designed in. So we have one customer that we took 17 parts in their drone and consolidated it into one single part that doesn't require all those separate discrete manufacturing steps, doesn't require all those assembly steps, and the outcome is higher performance, better, better looking than what they were able to produce before. But it's because that industry has very low thresholds to make changes um, and has a lot of a uh, lot of latitude, obviously less regulations, less qualification that has to happen. So that's where you'll see many of these disruptive approaches start to uh, manifest themselves earlier and faster, where some of the uh, industries that have a long, longer product refresh cycle and a little bit longer design cycle will take a little bit longer uh, for us to start seeing them on the street or in the stores. But yeah, that's well. It's funny you bring up the, uh, the the drone industry. We actually had a 
we have an episode I think has yet to be released. I don't think it's been released yet. Uh, by the time this is released, it will have been. Um, so I'll put that caveat in there. But where we're a uh, company that basically, uh, you know, some of their some of their big um, deployments have been in and warehousing and uh, in, in, in using drones to be able to um, essentially uh, take inventory. And you know, you're you're, much, you're seeing a million different applications in there, and certainly in that space, in aerospace in general. Um, the, 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 the lighter, the better. I'm a, so I'm a, uh, I'm a pilot geek. I'm a pilot and I'm, a, and I'm an aviation okay. geek. So I love all that stuff. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the lighter, the material, the more durable, the better. I mean, you mentioned in there with, you know, aircraft or even the same thing with, you know, with drones. I mean, you start getting metal out that not only are you saving from a weight standpoint, but you're also, uh, from a maintenance standpoint and having to worry about rust and, and, and different things there that, you know, will, will, will start to, you know, going away. So, um, uh, you know, and it's, it's interesting too, you know, when you look at, uh, from a fulfillment standpoint, Amazon, obviously there's getting a lot of press and stuff about how they're deploying all these different things between, you know, from, from a battery manufacturing standpoint, we, to get more efficiency, you know, as, as if we can reduce the components, re, you know, increase the, or decrease the drag, decrease the weight, all of this is driving towards actually making this a, you know, a real reality. That one day, you know, we'll have a pair, you know, drone will be delivering you know, whatever to us. They can yeah, a great, a, a great, a great example exactly to that point. You know, this is a bracket that you might see um, in any plane. This is kind of the classic um, type brackets that the metal 3D printing industry has been working on uh, developing uh, using topology optimization, which is software that instead of taking what that bracket used to be, which was simply two welded piece of, pieces of uh, sheet metal mm -hmm. with just holes drilled through, it takes that uh, essentially T bracket, they would call them, and then says, well, if we have to transmit stress from up here down into these areas, let's just run it more directly. And that's when the, the software does such an amazing job at making these elegant designs where the load literally follows the, mm. the path. And traditionally these weren't done because making this out of metal would have been really expensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, 3D printing opened up the possibility of shapes like this, but um, metal 3D printing is is actually using much heavier materials than we work with. Continuous fiber composites. Um, you can look at it with uh, with uh, a, a measure called specific strength and specific stiffness, where you take into account in the strength and stiffness the weight of the material, and that's where these continuous fiber composites have the highest specific stiffness and specific strength, and why they're used so broadly in aerospace. So we're able to use these ideal continuous materials and these shapes that have only been possible with 3D printing before. And the fibers actually wrap around the hole and then run all the way down the legs and they can wrap around the, the bottom hole here. So you can imagine your fasteners that are connecting this assembly, the load is being directly transferred down. We actually just published a paper with a top aerospace company where we were able to remove over 70% of the weight from these brackets that were made with uh, titanium 3D printing mm. using our methods. So, so that alone for a component that might number in the hundreds or thousands in large aircrafts is a, is a big deal when you're talking about the, um, you know, the future of aviation where they need to reduce their operating costs. Uh, and in addition to that, this represents one component that is connecting things together. When we think about a truss, you know, that one uh, bracket that I showed you is essentially like a unit cell in a much larger structure that we can look at making. What if we're not just bolting things together, but what if we're making larger integrated structures uh, like, like the, the large one that I was showing back here? And using part consolidation to get further benefits in terms of manufacturing and weight savings. And, and to your point, uh, these are corrosion resistant uh, or corrosion proof materials. So you, you don't have uh, the painting that you need, need to do in many of the post treatments with a lot of metals. Yeah, that's, uh, that's super exciting. What other industries are, are you guys doing a lot of work in? So, uh, so 
Aerospace obviously has um, the most experience working with these materials and the, the payoff in reducing the amount of jet fuel that's used yeah. is, is extremely high. So uh, because they are so expert in these materials and are really set up to, to digest a, a technology like ours, uh, that has been uh, an area that we've had a lot of um, uh, work since very early on with the company. Uh, drones are directly adjacent to it. Uh, everything we're doing in aerospace directly applies to drones and can happen a lot faster uh, because you're not flying people around. Right. Uh, yeah. So you don't have all, all of those, those qualification challenges. Really, the, the neat thing, um, though, is that all of these methods we're talking about that are important for aerospace, they can apply to all of the terrestrial vehicles as well. Um, and in fact, the reason that many of these aerospace methods haven't made their way into cars and trucks and, and all the rest is because the aerospace methods are so expensive uh, relative to the cost thresholds of, uh, of automotive. Uh, just a neat example, you know, these are two brackets that look almost the same that, that I was showing earlier. Um, and they are exactly the same shape, made on the same machine, but one is aerospace grade, peak carbon fiber, very high performance material. The other is, um, is automotive grade uh, nylon carbon fiber, much lower cost, a little bit lower performance, but um, uh, meets the, the thresholds of mass market automotive. So the, the nice thing is we can, uh, we can apply these aerospace methods to these broader uh, industries like uh, like automotive, uh, industrial applications, um, you know, lightweight structures can be used um, all over industries. Uh, and then sometimes we're looking at how do we pack more strength into a smaller space? So we might work on applications like seals or different mechanical mm -hmm. components. But when you're packing more strength into a smaller space, that's where we'll, we'll do all kinds of things for uh, consumer products as well. So you can actually see kind of a, a bit of a, a, a sample part that we have like a watch and you know some of the other parts that we're able to put um, in, in an incredibly small package uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the quickest kind of elevator pitch for our technology is that, you know, we can out of a automated molding system, get parts that have the strength of titanium, but they're one third the weight. So really we're able to hit the cost, uh, performance thresholds you need for mass market. And then we have the, the weight savings and, and the strength. And those really three concepts are why we're really broadly applicable. So you're asking about industries, aerospace, industrial, consumer products, um, uh, you know, and a, a wide variety of vehicle applications are some of the primary focuses. Excellent. Well, it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I imagine, you know, especially in the vehicles and, you know, uh, aerospace, anything that's getting, you know, consuming a lot of energy too has a great sustainability story to go along with it as well, just in terms of, you know, lower emissions and, you know, re, you know, re, you know, not only is there obviously a, a cost savings benefit, you know, from reduction in fuel, but also, you know, from the emission piece as well. So it sounds like a little bit of a, you know, a win or triple win. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the sustainability, it is so important to look at the um, energy saved by the component that you're making. Um, we, we also look a lot at what are the material inputs mm -hmm. and then what is the end of life. So we can really kind of think about these three phases when we're talking about uh, the total um, energy kind of embodied in, in a component. So we're working actually with a, a new class of composites. So, you know, since uh, you know, the Corvette, the like 1950s Corvette was one of the first composite success stories. Uh, so composites have been around for a while, but they've, they've used this, this matrix material of like super glue or epoxy that hasn't been recyclable. Um, we're actually working with the really next generation of composites that use the recyclable uh, resin systems. So uh, you know, we're, we're looking at how do we get cleaner chemistries? How do we get lower energy fibers? We can not only work with carbon fibers, but glass fibers. Then to your point, kind of in the middle, when we look at the uh, total 
lifetime um, savings, uh, energy savings of the part, you can factor that. And then end of life as well, uh, we're working on uh, some novel recycling technologies that uh, can take, um, take the end of life products and, and give them, um, give them uh, a, a, another, um, you know, taking this idea of kind of cradle to cradle, how do you uh, anticipate the end of life, uh, kind of when you're beginning, uh, planning the beginning of the next generation. Well, excellent. No, it sounds like you guys are really onto something. Sounds like there's some, you know, some cool stuff coming down the, the pike for you. Um, my last question I want to ask before we kind of wrap up the segment uh, is actually, um, in, uh, you know, kind of going back a little bit to what we were uh, talking about before as, as far as um, uh, maybe some influences in your life. And you mentioned, you know, book reading and all that good stuff and how, you know, you, your Audible, you know, account is very full. Um, what is, uh, what are you reading right now or listening to? So I'm, I'm going to check my, check my <laughs> audible, uh, when you're, when you're asking, I'll, you know, I've got a, a bunch of the HBRs, um, you know, you guide twos, uh, I'm always listening to those. What, I, what I'm actually excited about is, uh, Malcolm Gladwell has the new talking to strangers book that I, I actually literally just downloaded and I haven't, haven't read yet. So. So that's what's what's queued up now. Um, in term in terms of influences, I, I think that there's also no substitute for you know obviously mentors and you know there have been um, uh, you know through through our history there's a lot of credit that some some really strong mentors have have played uh, for uh, for me personally and our management team. Um, you know, Carl Bass, former CEO of Autodesk, uh, who was an early advisor, um, angel investor, um, just continual sounding board over the years, being able to, you know, have um, have individuals like him help help guide the ship and um, and and think through some of the hard decisions and kind of give give me the conviction. Um, you know, a big, oh, a big debt of gratitude to him for that. Uh, there's also uh, when uh, we were raising our Series A, having a chance to meet Jeff Immelt, who uh, former CEO of GE, uh, who is a partner at our VC, our now VC firm NEA, who we've had a long-term great relationship with, um, and you know, having him share um, his background and starting his career in the composites industry in the 1980s when the the chop fiber version of composites were being adopted by the automotive industry and and hearing kind of his on the ground stories about what those major shifts in industry look like you know there's 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 no substitute for for great mentors but the next best thing is listening to their book if you can <laughs> that's awesome yeah no it's fantastic so um, Ethan, thank you so much for spending some time with me today on the um, executive series. Uh, for those who'd like to learn a little bit more, uh, give us your website. What's, uh, what's the best? Yeah, to... ericscomposites.com. ericscomposites.com. We'll make sure that's in the show notes for those who are listening to the podcast and um, in the notes for those who are watching the videos. Ethan, thanks so much for your time and uh, best of luck. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Great to meet you. Great meeting you. All right, well, that wraps today's Industrial Sage Executive Series with Ethan Eskowitz, who is the CEO and founder of Ares Composites. If you go to their website, check them out, learn more about them. Um, and before we wrap, uh, if you are not uh, subscribed onto our email list, I highly encourage you to do so. You're missing out on some fantastic content that we've got other episodes uh, of the Executive Series like this. We have uh, the Bright Ideas Series by Acuity, which is uh, very exciting, manufacturing news, and many other things that are gonna be happening uh, as we continue to, uh, to move this train uh, down the road. So thanks for watching or listening. I'm Danny Gonzalez, and I'll be back next week with another episode on Industrial Sage. Industrial Sage is an open platform where companies can showcase their expertise and solutions to a captive audience of industrial professionals. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and while you're there, please leave us a review. Want us to tell your story? Go to industrialsage.com. This week's episode was produced by Rika Wiersma, filming by Donovan Jones, editing by Rika Wiersma, music composed by Oliver Michael, and executive producers Danny Gonzalez and David Karen. This is the Industrial Sage Executive Series. <laughs>